The internet's a place where everybody goes when they have questions, and unfortunately, you may not always find the right answers. Today, we're gonna to be exploring some of the questions and answers you might find in spiritual Quora. Quora is known for being the site where you can get answers to questions by real professionals, but as of lately, things have changed a bit and their definition of uh, professional has become quite lenient. So we're gonna be looking at some of those answers. So in today's video, we're gonna be going over some questions we haven't seen yet and see what the experts have to say. I'm John, this is Jazz, and welcome to Mystic Talk. Now before we get started, don't forget to follow us on all of our social media platforms to watch all of our daily content and to see all the amazing things that we do here at Cielo Mystic. So if you're into the metaphysical world, you're in the right place. That being said, let's get back to the video. And so the first question we have is how do healing crystals work? Uh, Franklin's a professional writer, he says, that's easy, they don't. First off, Franklin, you don't know nothing about your professional writer. Yeah, what do you know about crystals, man? Um, well, how do healing crystals work? Well, I think it's a very subjective experience. I think that everyone experiences crystals differently and whether you see them as like having healing properties or just like the fact that, you know, they're a very pretty rare mineral and like studying geology, then, you know, everyone has something they can get from crystals, you know? I think that um, there's a lot of people ready to kind of uh, disprove and bash what other people's beliefs are, but I think it's a very subjective experience. If you feel like crystals work for you a certain way and they work for you that way, then so be it. Besides, every healing experience is different. You know, certain people use crystals and certain people use oils and herbs to help them in the healing process. So just because it doesn't work for you doesn't mean that it can't work for other people. So the next question is, is it bad to wear mold bite and an evil eye necklace? <laughs> So John Jeremy, <laughs> why does he have two first names? Okay, first off, John Jeremy, and your profession is podcasting. <laughs> now podcasting. Now podcasting. What was it before? Who knows? <laughs> His answer is only if the colors clash. Moldavite has no special powers, and there is no such thing as the EY. So your decision is purely an aesthetic one. I mean, as far as style goes, yeah, I guess if like. Evil Eye doesn't match. I guess like, he has a point. <laughs> but as far as Moldavite having any special powers, like I said, everyone's experience is subjective. Moldavite is a silica-based material that came from outer space. It doesn't really need much to make it special. Um, it's already and, awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's already awesome. And you know, I've said this before at the shop, like people that come to the shop, they have crystals and their experience is very unique to them as individuals. And a lot of the times I see crystals more like as tools or amplifiers mm -hmm. for, for, for their energy. It's not like the crystal has any powers. I don't really think any crystal has powers. I think people as individuals have power and crystals help support that, amplify that, like batteries, you know? The power would still be there within the individual. The crystals are just aids that you use mm -hmm. to kind of help you along that process. And I do see people that eventually grow out of crystals and grow out of moldavite and move on to other things that help them grow as individuals. How do you charge crystals in the moonlight? <laughs> just hand your credit card to whoever you're buying them from, of course. No other meaning of the word charge makes any sense here at all. But Bob Myers, an electrical engineer, technologist, and a tech geek. Mm. I see. Well, I mean, I'm, there's no denying Bob is probably a really smart guy. I mean, coming from the standpoint of an electrical engineer and his concept of the word charge, if you if you saw it from the outsider's perspective, you might think that, you know, it makes a little bit of sense that crystals can't be charged, you know? But, you know, in the culture of, you know, new age metaphysics, there, there has been this concept of charging your crystals or putting them in the moonlight so they could pick up the energy that might be from like a solar eclipse or a full moon or something of that nature. And usually the people that are into crystals are definitely more aware of uh, not energy or charge in the traditional sense, like an electrical charge, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. more like energy as a free-flowing spirit that mm -hmm. connects 
all living things, much like the force, you know? Exactly, like the moon represents something in itself, you know, the moon is like the divine feminine energy, helping you get in tune with your intuition, you know, helping you access that more spiritual aspect of your being, your inner knowing, your inner guidance, so it's important for somebody who wants to gain more of that ability to use the energy of the moon um, to help them kind of just get more in tune with themselves. So when they mean charge, they mean charging the crystal with that vibration, with that energy, so that they can carry that energy with them, learn from it, and use it in their spiritual growth. So how do you open up your third eye and how do you know it's open? Answered by Rachel Fruman, who is a spiritual healer and a fanatic about all things transformational growth. Mm, really cool. Yeah. And she said three things to look Four as signs that your third eye is opening. First, you begin to notice things that you didn't notice before. You crave the feeling of connection. You might feel more connected to yourself or you might feel more connected to nature. And uh, you want to eliminate toxicity. Oh, that's another thing that you might find common around people that have a uh, third eye opening or opened. And yeah, I mean, when you first open up your third eye, there's definitely some changes. You start seeing the world from a different perspective. You might start seeing some of the social programming that has already been placed there in society and uh, you start questioning uh, regular ways of doing things or, or like the traditional way of doing things. Usually people that are uh, going through a process of opening up their third eyes are, are, aren't going through like a comfortable time. It's not like, it's not, easy. it's not an easy thing to do, you know, it's actually a very uh, emotionally draining process, you know, so when people say that they want to open up their third eye or when, when they say that they, they've already done it, Usually I like to take it with a grain of salt, not because I don't believe that they can do it. I, I, I know everyone has the ability to do that. I just, I just don't think that the average person would want the responsibility and consequences that might come along with opening up your third eye. So she makes some really valid points. You know, you, you try to eliminate toxicity. You want to eliminate all the negative influences that you might have in your life. And that might also come with like changing your diet. And the people that you're surrounded by or the things that you do, or the way that you even think. So in a way, when you open your third eye, you're also changing your whole view of the world and yourself. So that's very intense. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, not everybody's up for it. Next question. Hmm? Oh, okay. How do physics work? Wait, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <Say> <laughs> physics. <laughs> How do psychics work? How do psychics work? Hmm. Okay. Answered by a skeptic of long standing. That's his profession. That's his profession. He's a a skeptic. skeptic. All right, let's hear this answer, okay? Determined by over 100 years of research, uh, defraud people of their money by convincing them that they could foretell the future. Speak with dead relatives, guide one to one's true love, or any of the other claims that they give you. Bottom line, no one has ever been able to demonstrate any paranormal abilities. When tested under these conditions, these four psychics, all persons so tested have been exposed as frauds or shown to be diluted. Diluted. One of those two. Oh. Interesting. This guy definitely has, I mean, maybe like he was bullied by a fortune teller or something. I don't know who knows. Jeez, I don't know what, what he's been He really through. doesn't like them. I mean, he's he's... He's a skeptic, though. He's a skeptic. That's well, you job. know what? Okay, it would yeah. be it would be wrong for us to just completely ignore some mm -hmm. of the points that he's making. You know, like in any profession, there are people that go into the profession just to scam others, yeah. and that is that is totally wrong. We do not consent that and or condone that. You know, yeah. it's, 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 it happens. Though. It does. But um, a lot of the spiritual people that I've met and that I've dealt with are professional individuals, people with like degrees in psychology, people with like degrees in like therapy and they use tarot readings and and uh, things of that nature to kind of supplement their work and he's actually wrong. Carl Jung has actually studied uh, paranormal and psychic ability under controlled conditions and mm -hmm. he's, he's amongst one of the many other uh, psychiatrists, therapists and researchers that has studied um, metaphysics and you know what you might consider uh, superhuman abilities under controlled scientific settings. But how do psychics really work though? Psychics are individuals who have spiritual gifts, spiritual abilities that they use to guide others along the spiritual path. Um, there are mediums, clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, 
there's a bunch of clairs out there, you know, and each person is able to use those abilities to kind of hack into you, you could say, kind of just figure out what type of energy is going on with you. They can see dead relatives, certain people can only. Only clairvoyants can see those things um, because they have the ability of sight. And sometimes you could hear with clairaudience. So depending on who you work with, you'll get different results. You can't always get a connection with a relative. Sometimes you'll only get advice. Sometimes people will just tell you how you could go through the healing journey. So there's many options when it comes to psychics. And it's always good to do your research on them. Don't let them contact you first. If somebody contacts you first, just just don't do it you know no. that's how most scams start like I have sadly so many clients that come to me and they tell me like oh this person contacted me saying that my ancestors want me to do this and this and I'm just like no don't don't listen to them <laughs> like if you are searching for something you will find it on your own and you will go to people to, you know person to person and figure out who is the best person to guide you because there's so many people that are on the spiritual journey and it's better that you figure that out on your own and you let your intuition guide you don't let somebody else do that for you you know so that's what i would advise you um, and, and don't western union anybody or like zelle or cash app or something without without knowing that they're a legit company you know it's mm -hmm. so easy to lose your money and especially if somebody comes to you with like your spiritual guides have been trying to talk to you and you should send me money so that I can help you fix it, that's when you should be very suspicious. Yeah, no real psychic will do that. <laughs> no. So the next question we have is, how do psychics work scientifically? Uh, Craig Weiler, an associate member of the Parapsychological Association. Okay, nice. That's cool. Yeah. Psychic abilities are believed to originate in the subconscious mind, which is always on. Some experiences that we take as normal may actually be categorized as psychic. Hunches, intuition, having a feeling about something or someone, knowing that you're being stared at without seeing the person, synchronicities, other things that are part of most people's lives. And there are people that choose to ignore those signs, and there are people that choose to not ignore them. And I think that really makes a difference. I think that all the humans have yeah. what you might call psychic abilities, but uh, some choose to ignore it. In different levels too, everybody has certain senses a little heightened, others a little lower, and it's important that you figure that out. Yeah, I'm a firm believer that there's no need for you to actually open up your third eye, because once you reach a certain age, it's going to open up anyways. Especially after you have kids and after you start having a family, you start developing an intuition about them and their growth and their development, and that almost becomes like an extra sensory perception. And, and that's quite amazing because even people that don't believe in psychic abilities in the traditional sense will admit that, you know, there is that intuition that they might have as far as, you know, the safety of their loved ones might go. The basic default for functioning is the ordinary senses, which are far more reliable under most circumstances. It's only when we need information that is outside of the abilities of our other senses that psychic abilities come become noticeable. The ability for a person to tolerate a state of ambiguity where they don't usually know something and resist coming to a conclusion is related to having a psychic experience. Creative, strong, logical thinking and high emotional intelligence seem to be positive factors in how well a person does at psychic tasks. What Craig is basically saying that the more creative and emotionally aware that the person is, the more likely they are to be aware of their psychic abilities or to develop psychic abilities and he has a point if you start looking into let's say the mirror breaks personality test it talks about intuitives and sensors mm -hmm. people that like to see the world in the logical traditional way and people that don't feel that, that feel comfortable being in ambiguity and looking at things from a different perspective one thing i really like that he mentioned is that these abilities can be greatly improved with training just like with anything in life, is if you're working out, if you're learning to do a new skill, you need to keep on trying it and trying it and trying it until you get better. Uh, the same thing goes with intuition. Um, when you hear certain thoughts come to you, when you just feel a random sensation to do something, instead of ignoring that, you actually will go and do it. And that's actually how you'll find yourself in certain situations in life where you actually realize like, oh, I was right about something. I was right about a person not being very 
nice, you know. I was right about trusting my intuition with certain decisions in my own day-to-day -day life. And because of that, you're able to maneuver things a little bit easier. How do you use your first tarot card? Okay, uh, by Chris Anderson. Uh, no profession, just, uh, <laughs> just Chris Anderson. Mm. Nice. Tarot cards are not magical. They will not teach you the future or get you in touch with spirits or any type of magical things people claim. They're not better than a Rorschach test. One, first of all, the Rorschach test has been disproven and is no longer used in the psychological world. It is actually not even part of the DSM-5. And if it's not part of the DSM-5, there's a good chance it's not gonna make it to the next step either. So the Rorschach test isn't so uh, credible anymore. Um, and, you know, to kind of further elaborate, you know, on this question, I don't really think this person knows much about Rorschach tests or tarot cards. Uh, it is a very old, old form of divination. Tarot cards are not a new age thing. They're quite, quite old. And, you know, the, the original playing game of the tarot cards came in much later, but the major arcana is hundreds of years old. This is, these are archetypes. These are our, our personality archetypes that reflect themselves through people over generations. And um, that's part of the reason why they're so effective at reading the future, as you may, because they're actually a map of mm -hmm. the subconscious mind. As you shuffle them up and deal with the cards, you interrupt them for your, interpret them for yourself, and you shed light on the frame of mind. If in turn, if you turn the death card and you think your mother's dying, it means that your mother's dying. First of all, the death card does not mean that at all. And no, if, if he knew, if Chris knew anything about tarot cards, he would know that the death card has nothing to do with a physical death. The death card has everything to do with changes, obstacles, and, and situations that might arise in your everyday life. And something that forces you to move forward. Yeah, definitely a transformative period in your life. Whenever you see death, death means the end of something. So you could be ending a relationship, you could be ending a way of being, a way of thinking, um, and entering a new cycle into your life. So death does not always mean literal death, you know? And actually, when I see the death card, um, people see it as a bad thing, but it's actually a very beautiful process and letting go of something, maybe letting go of a trauma, letting go of something that you don't need anymore is very beneficial to your spiritual growth. He closes with, uh, at least tarot cards will help you as it is a psychological tool for self-examination, something which um, I partially agree with, you know, partially. I, I don't think that people do, should do their own tarot readings unless they are like, mm -hmm. you know, skilled at doing it already and, and are aware of how to look at the divination tool. Uh, and the unbiasedly. symbolism that it comes with. Yeah. yeah, because there's so much symbolism in tarot cards that date back thousands of years, you know, and all these symbols like stars, like water, like mountains, what do they all represent? The staffs, the swords, mm -hmm. the wands, all that stuff. Those are very old symbols that uh, that are not new to, to the human condition. No, and that's actually how humans communicate, you know, that's how we figure things out, through symbols. Um, and using these symbols to figure out what is going on with your life and how we could fix that issue is what tarot cards are really for. They're not there to divine the future because at the end of the day, even if you see death, death will not kill you. Death means that you're going to enter a new chapter and you could use that to actually fix what may, what may come in your future. So it's actually not a solid thing all the time. Um, whenever we do card readings, when I say something to you, it doesn't mean that it will happen 100% of what I just said, you know? It, it could happen exactly the way I said it, but most likely, according to your decisions and your own choices, because you have free will, um, you'll be able to change it for yourself. Yeah. So tarot cards are actually great to helping you figure out your next move. For self-assessment. Also, I do readings myself, guys. That's why I know some of this information. Um, if you ever want to book a reading with me, I do them through the phone. You could call our number at Cielo Mystic and book an appointment with me. Okay, if you had to choose one crystal to start your crystal collection, what would it be? That's a really cool question, actually. Answered by Indigo Arya. Metaphysics and spiritual mechanics is a passion of mine. That's her profession. It depends on who you are, really. <laughs> it depends on what you know your biggest issues are in life. Yeah, that's, that's definitely something to start with. You know, what is something that you struggle with? You struggle with anxiety. 
Do you struggle with fear? Maybe you're not a grounded person, you're disorganized. There's so many things that you could figure out, you know, about yourself. Okay, I don't know you know, when somebody comes in and mm -hmm. says that they want a crystal for this, mm -hmm. it shows us that they obviously have a problem. Like, it's, it's really hard to say, hey, I have anxiety. It's a little easier to say, hey, I would like a crystal for anxiety. Mm -hmm. And from from one standpoint, you know, it's it's the first step to fixing the problem is admitting that there is a problem there. Mm -hmm. And when people come to us for crystals for X thing or Y thing, you know, one of the first things they tell them is that they should touch the crystals themselves. We have suggestions, but it's really about how those crystals make them feel. Yeah, each crystal works differently with your energy body. You know, there's there's always somebody who will tell you, especially on the internet, that specific crystals can't go with certain ones or you can't work with this one if you're not this sign. And that's not true. You know, you have to feel it for yourself. You have to try them out, see how they make you feel, see if they help you bring more awareness to certain things because really that's what crystals do. They just help you bring awareness to your emotions. For example, if you have anxiety and you work with a stone that helps with anxiety, that stone is just going to kind of remind you like, okay, yes, I'm an anxious person, but I could change that and I'm improving myself little by little. Or if you have a hard time speaking, you look at your crystal, you feel it, you let it kind of like give you the courage and strength to speak your mind, to speak your truth. So it's really beautiful, you know, because in a way you kind of have like that reminder to become aware that you can change something. Um, and it's, it's really nice to be able to have that guidance with you. She continues to say if you have like higher vibrational crystals, like let's say kyanite, appetite, mold divide, uh, it's something that might propel you paranormally, like labradorite or tektites, or something that might help you like with love, like unikite rose quartz, or something for absorbing negativity, like tourmaline, you can go on and on. You know, people have these ideas of what crystals do, and these ideas are not new. It's not like it's a, you know, mm -hmm. something that people came up with last week. There, there are things that that people have been using for hundreds if not thousands of years using these crystals for these purposes. Um, it could be culturally, it could be that you know ancient deities might have required a certain crystal and now that crystal is associated with that deity. So then that that the characteristics of that crystal are now also the same characteristics of the deity that would have required that crystal and that's how the culture kind of goes forward recognizing those stones for those purposes. So I think what Indigo is trying to say is that you should try to cater your crystals to what you're going through. Personally though, if you ask me, the, the first crystal I had was Malachite and um, still my favorite crystal aside from Moldavite too. They're definitely kind of my, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, have to, I have to change it up a bit, but Malachite with a little gold always looks nice. Yes, um, aside from that, uh, that's because he connects with that stone very deeply. Um, and you may connect with a different one, may not be malachite. Um, one other one that I usually suggest is clear quartz, uh, just because it's a universal stone, uh, the universal healer, master healer, so it could work with anyone. It's clear, you know, you could just input your energy into it, it could guide you and help you along the first steps. Uh, on working with crystals, so that's an option too. So how does one cleanse a room of negative energy without burning anything, sage, incense sticks, etc.? Uh, how can I cleanse a room of negative energy? Answered by Eric Petrosian, a conservative Christian skeptic and a proud American. That's his profession. <laughs> well, it's, that's his profession. Yeah, he's okay. a proud American. Huh? Cool. Well, I mean, thank you for answering. You know, it's uh, he goes on to say, well, first you would have to find the exact definition of what negative energy is, then you can't, can you? Because there's no such thing as negative energy. Well, there's black matter, I would consider that negative energy, but beyond the point. Mm -hmm. Because there's such thing as cleansing, the idea of cleansing has nothing to do, it's all made up, superstitious nonsense, believed in only by the extremely gullible. Well, who knows, yeah. People toss around the word energy as though it has some deep meaning, mystical or spiritual meaning, and yet, LOL, not one of the people using the word can actually define energy. Uh, yes, we can. <laughs> we could definitely define 
uh, the energy that we're referring to, but I feel like a lot of people, especially someone who comes from his background, have already made their choice, have already made up their mind about what these things are and what the th these things aren't. And if this person, I mean, as far as calling himself a Christian, you know, the Holy Spirit, that that is that whole concept of the Holy Spirit can also be seen as energy. You can't mm -hmm. touch, you can only feel the Holy Spirit. So just right off the bat. Yeah, and believing in, in God, you know, God is also energy. God is everything, right? According the to The willingness them. to believe in something mm -hmm. that isn't a physical thing, but that can interact with you in your life, that is energy. And I mean, it's really interesting that Eric would go on and, and you know, start bashing on something that you can't touch, feel, or prove and yet call himself a Christian. That's <laughs> um, It's magnetic, electrical, thermal, kinetic, gravitation. Again, this is something that I, I'm really happy that we get to see here and put it on display because there are, there are different types of people. There are people that like to think conventional and they like to see the world in four dimensions or three dimensions and they like to see the world under the conditions of like the traditional way of thinking and that's okay. We need, we need boring people like that to keep things going, you know? But if you're a person that likes to fantasize, that likes to theorize, that likes to see the world for more than it is, then you're the type of person that's gonna continue helping the collective grow. Creative people that put their soul out there and allow that to become something beyond themselves. Yeah, at the end of the day, you won't grow and you can't. Your community can grow. You can grow mentally, emotionally. You can't heal without any of these concepts. You know, even you being a Christian alone, you're just contradicting yourself at the end of the day. Yeah, like people have these titles that they've kind of mm -hmm. placed on themselves from the get go and they use it to identify in the world around them, but they may not themselves know what these titles truly mean. And, you know, as an artist, I can tell you that when my work is out there, it definitely has an effect on people. And I'm surrounded by great artists that their work affects people emotionally. It moves them, if you may. And, you know, the language that we use, the vocabulary that we use for energy, we also use for creative expression. I think I think it would be it would be unfair to say that that art is not it, it, real or true since it doesn't have any scientific effect or, or a surface way of seeing it you know mm -hmm. if you see if you see it strictly from a, a scientific standpoint you know there's nothing uh, special about a painting because it's not magnetic it's not electrical it's not thermal it, it kinetic gravitational it doesn't fall under these scientific uh, concepts. Yeah, so people you, are still drawn to them very intensely, still, yeah. you know. They still want to see the Mona Lisa, which is an old ass painting, you could say, of just a woman smiling slightly. Is she really smiling? You know, not everybody can really tell. Yeah. So it's like, but it still moves people <laughs> anyways, yes. you know, and it still has a huge impact on our history and on humanity and how we've evolved as humans just by this little painting. It's evolved all of our art. So in a way, like using that is also energy. So to answer the question, you know, how do you cleanse a room of negative energy without burning anything? I recommend you sprays. Like there are room sprays out there that you can buy them at the shop, Salem Mystic, you can buy them anywhere at your local metaphysical shop. You can even make them yourselves. There's so many things you could do to cleanse a space. You can you could be a good Christian and go get some holy water, put that in a spray bottle, and spray it around, and bam, you just cleanse your room. All right guys, this is the last question. Does Moldavite really work? Mm. Eleanor Clementine studied at dating and relationships with narcissist. Okay, that's her profession. Right. Nice. <laughs> There's an imposter out there. Unfortunately, I have not really felt much from Multivite myself. I feel a lot from Appetite, Miriam, Jasper, Bloodstone, Bismuth, but I really do not see what the fuss is about Multivite. I figure I have not experienced a lot of the real thing. Who knows? Maybe, maybe she has, you know, real Multivite, and she didn't really feel much about it. Like I said. The, the crystal experience is quite subjective. Yeah, it, could, it changes depending on the person. Or maybe she, she doesn't have real multivite and she's just holding a, like, a little green piece of Heineken bottle or something. Who knows? <laughs> there, there could be many things that, that, mm. that Eleanor might, have, might be experiencing. I, I personally don't know what multivite she has. I know that if she reached out to me, I'd hook her up with a nice piece. 
But aside from that, you know, she does. She is obviously sensitive to other crystals. Yeah. And I, I personally feel like there are people that are not sensitive to crystals that will not see it from from the perspective that some of the spiritual community might see it. So that's something that you have to keep in mind. Uh, Eleanor doesn't seem to be someone like that, and uh, she she does have genuine experiences with crystals. Yeah, she seems to have worked with crystals as well. So I think uh, when it comes to Moldavite. Hopefully she has a real one. <laughs> Just hasn't worked out for her, you know. Moldavite is the stone of transformation and change, you know. So maybe you just don't need that transformation and change in these moments. For you, you could work with other stones to help you better in your spiritual journey and growth. So that concludes the questions on Cora today. Um, they were definitely super interesting. Some were really skeptical people that were like, this stuff does not exist. And other people were very insightful and had very beautiful answers actually. Thank you so much guys for being in tune today for the first episode of Mystic Talks. We look forward to having great conversations with you guys. Feel free to comment, like, subscribe, uh -huh. shout us out, yes. let everybody know about us and let them know. come check this, the next videos out. And if you guys want, we're very open to your suggestions about the next Mystic Talk. And if you want to join us, come on, come on over. We'd love to have you over. <laughs> come on over to the studio. Bye, Bye everybody. everybody.